Yeah, it is a small group. Um, and it is, we have one facilitator per five kids. So oh, okay. make sure because somebody could be doing woodwork there. Others could be with a panga, you know, like a knife throwing a knife there. We have parkour and bushcraft. So we learn to, in fact, it's probably the only school where kids carry knives because mm -hmm. they know how to sharpen it. They know how to throw it. They know how to carve sticks with it. We, I use my knife for absolutely everything, you know. Right, for, right. For, This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. There we go. Welcome, Nico. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <I> Don. <laughs> so, um... <clears throat> This is our first time meeting, so let's let's give an, our audience a sense of, of who you are and what you're up to. Oh dear, you got to give me a time check on it. I usually go on for ages, you know. Days when <laughs> I when I still thought I was employable, I'd send people CVs or bios, and I'd like we didn't ask for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Okay, so in brief, I'll just start where I'm at. I've got a um, learning center, specifically not called a school. Mm. That I've been running for seven years, nice. created from the dust on a farm. Uh, because, yeah, I'm 55, turning 56 soon. And of mm. all the years of teaching in every single kind of level, primary, secondary, tertiary, pre-primary, mm. doesn't matter what, government, private, blah, blah. It all sucked. It mm. really was terrible. You know, the pre-primaries were kind of cute. Right. The kids were happy enough, you know, because we played, all of us played. But all of the rest of it, the best institution I ever, out of all of these places that I, that I taught at, was, and I keep telling people that, was a prison school, a youth mm. prison school. They were awaiting trial, but these were like serious criminals. Yeah. And I taught, anyway... Because we knew all, okay, this is a prison, okay? So within that confines, we could have a free class. But mm -hmm. all the others, of course, masquerade as a school or whatever they call it. And it is actually a prison. So, you know, there yeah. was the that. But any event, so after all that, I decided I have to <laughs> have to create my own school. Yeah. The way I grew up and what I would have liked to have as a school. And there we are. So we are kind of a farm school, I guess. But our basic premise is a radical self-responsibility and nature mm. is our teacher. Nice. Nature nice. is our teacher, natural law, God's law. We are self-reliant, off-grid. And mm. so we are our own government. Everybody is our own leader, you know. And um, I've got a bunch of unschoolers, de-schoolers, de-programmers, <laughs> uh, and a couple of sort of homeschoolers that do kind of programs that are registered. But I've, you know, I don't encourage those because again, mm. the content of all of those programs, you know, what that is. Right. So yeah. a bunch of kids they come from all over, and it's a, it's a very self-directed process from the word go in terms of. They can say, do they want to come every day? Some come once a week because they come mm. from far, etc. And even uh, according to their budget, you know, and yeah, some yeah. can even work as a trade in lieu of, oh. mm -hmm. etc. Et so it's beautiful how they call me the organic mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. Yeah, that's really, it's, I mean, I'm an artist and all those things, but really I'm just a free guy that would like everybody to be free or at least have free will and then choose if they don't want to be free but be right, conscious right. Of the shoes, you know yeah. so that's what we do and we make it up as we go we do have a rhythm we play right. um and our, our, our a lot of our and I, I saw it also it's it's in your notes in the pdf notes a lot of the discipline or self-discipline here comes is based on and i do it playfully with the kids um, Ultimate Frisbee. I don't know if you're familiar oh, really? with that game. I, I, I've, I have seen the game, but I don't know any, much about it. So. Yeah, it's an international game. I mean, it's a beach game, but it's also right. an international game. You're like proper like World Cup soccer, you know, uh, like yeah. it goes big. But it is a self 
self-governed game. It's a self-adjudicated game. Right. Self-read game. So, for example, just a few things, and that's how we operate here. Um, so you play. If there's an infringement, and obviously it'll be between two players of opposing teams, you put up your hand and say, conversation. The game mm. stops, and these two people have a conversation. And yeah. they like decide and discuss. If they can't decide who's who takes the first pee or whose it was, they go back to the previous move. Simple as that. And then mm -hmm. every time you draw, you change sides. <laughs> mm. It's a bit of a pen game in a way. You know, yeah. the older you are, like, always, oh, which side are we playing now? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, that, that's interesting because one of the, when I uh, was uh, volunteering at the Village Free School um, many years ago, but uh, one of the things I found was, was so, so that experience was so different from even a few years previous to that. I volunteered at, or not volunteered, I was actually on staff at an after school program at a local Catholic school. And it was just so remarkable that in the Catholic school, you know, we're in a, uh, part of it was, it was an after school program and we uh, have a very age mixed group uh, from, from K to eight, so kindergarten to eighth graders. So, you know, six years old to about 13. And the older kids were a lot bigger than the little kids. And at the Catholic school, they wouldn't change the rules. They, like, they, they were saying, it's got to be like this. And, and, and then when I was at the village free school, the reason I brought this up is because a few years later, I'm working at the village or uh, volunteering at the village free school. And, and they have this game that is based on four square. So, you know, a ball in squares on the ground, you know. And, yeah. and they created... They started modifying the rules to make sure that the little kids could have a good time with the big kids. So this went all the way up to 17, 18 years old. And so there, the culture was that you, you changed rules to make sure everyone was having fun. Now, that doesn't mean that the little kids didn't sometimes get frustrated and there was you know, the kid who, no matter what rule you put in place, they complained. You know? <laughs> like it didn't eliminate conflict. Um, but it certainly modified it a lot, and and so there was a culture of it's about having fun. It's about including as many people as we can. Not necessarily always everyone gets their way, but it means you know the kids having this idea that you should be more flexible. And so it was no longer Forsker. It was I forgot what they called it, but at one time I asked them. I was kind of having a conversation about this interesting way that they were playing. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, one time we had nine squares because they wanted to include so many kids. And, and the other thing was that they did, it was such a popular game. And so the lines, you know, they would have kids waiting to play. And so four squares weren't enough. You could include more people if you have more squares. So, hey, add more squares. <laughs> you know? So, so that, that really is, I, I think that's one of the things that, that I think is, a, is a, an important aspect of the culture of, Many of the democratic schools, to use that term, um, like uh, village free school identifies as a democratic school. Um, you know, you, you don't identify as a school. And, and yet that's kind of the, you know, I, I call this program the agentic schools because I'm really trying to find where are the places where children are supported to have the agency to, to really figure out how to make things work. You know, we as adults provide something, you know, like you based on Ultimate Frisbee or you're, you're using that game as a context for, again, it's like, we all need those inspirations. How are we going to do it? Now, you're in South Africa, right? Yes. Near, uh, I looked it up, a little, little kind of west-northwest of, uh, of uh, okay. Durban, right? Yes. So, so you're, very cool. So, so I'm, I'm in the United States. Uh, so it's, a, it's on the internet. Who knows where people will be when they listen to this? Um, and, and so it's really interesting to me that, that these things go different places. Um, you know, this, in this series, I'll be talking to people in, you know, all over the world. I, you know, soon, uh, someone from England and more people from the U.S. And so, so part of what I'm, what I'm want to kind of bring to this is to say, you know, there's something going on. It, it's, it's cultural, not in the sense of a country culture. It's yes. cultural in a sense of, of how you organize things really matters. And so I'm really interested, you know, not identifying as a school and providing support to these uh, communities, homeschoolers, unschoolers, de-schoolers, 
uh, people who are really kind of, you know, they're saying there, there's something about that, the way schools worked traditionally, even yourself, you know, <laughs> been there, done that, and, and that wasn't what nurtured my soul. How can we do something better? So, so how did you, you know, like, you told how you got there. Tell me a little more about, like, I noticed you had on, on your website kind of a, a day-to-day structure kind of thing is, and, and tell me, you know, size of the group that you have, age range, and, and kind of how you operate day-to-day. Okay, so what I got from the preschools, the Montessori's and so on, is that there's a rhythm. A rhythm mm-hmm. is a good thing. I have my own rhythm, which is becomes a, it's basically self brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Something for 21 days, okay? That's it. You're going to do it. I mean, like we do brain gym, and that is, you know, and you kind of get it. So in terms, and it's like driving a car. So and now if you do repeat, 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 so then good practice. Of course, bad practice, repeat as the same, you know, garbage in, garbage out, or good stuff in, good stuff out. So, so a rhythm is like a, so that, that, you know, we are a natural environment. Um, mm-hmm. so that we also work seasonal. And I like to honor always the natural rhythms. There are times when there's more to harvest, times there's less mm-hmm. to harvest times when in winter things rest and that's important and then other things we dry and so on bringing the harvest Mm. we know those rhythms so the same in every day so every day starts with basic a warm-up which i call yoga light Mm. (laughs) (laughs) and a bit of brain gym left and right brain gym and then we have most more often than not an ultimate frisbee game uh and it's a, a a game and we can even make up a game if it be mm. soccer because there's little ease we wouldn't play with a soccer ball because they get hit in the face they are just mm. at that level with from the biggies so we would play with a bigger ball or an inflatable mm. ball, you know yeah. and the big guys we would call it gorilla soccer for example and the big guys can just hit like sort of like with their fists at the bottom you know so not mm. with their feet that kind of thing and, and everybody take off your shoes or not depending mm-hmm. on the ultimate game the aim you were saying about fun the aim of each game is to have fun and then it's about okay you can win or not it doesn't really matter some are come more competitive than others i just like yeah. a beautiful game beauty for me is everything you know so i forget which side i'm on it's very frustrating for people but there are it's a spirit it's having fun and that wins it always wins so any event so we have a quick game and that for me is the life skill thing because how do you play a mm-hmm. game are you in it to win it are you going to collaborate? Are you going to give the little least their one or two or three chances? And they all do. My um, size is so it is a range. It can go from four, age four, up to 17. And mm-hmm. very different abilities. Right. You know, some are la- in like labels. I don't do labels. If parents come and they say this one's ADHD and that one's that. I like, I go, I just go glaze, gloss, you know, my <laughs> face, I just go Vaseline lenses pretend i don't yeah and then i tell them i don't do labels label is like a gravestone you put it on a thing and that that guy's never going to get up okay he's Mm. that thing um and for me anybody we're all here to evolve and grow and you know and the parents don't believe me they like their boxes because they can control it (laughs) they can medicate it i flow with it and it's amazing what you do if you treat people absolutely all equal Okay, obviously everybody is different, so equal but unique. Right. So <laughs> and you we the, meet them where they're at, and it's amazing what they can do. You know, if right. you don't put your foot on it. <laughs> so that's my. So then after that in the game, and we lacquer, and we warmed up, and the blood's flowing, and our left and right brain has been balanced, and we've mm-hmm. stretched. Then we come in for. For three days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we come in. So that's about half an hour. And then we come in and we do what we we laughingly call academics. <laughs> but we basically settle down on a, on a chair or on a beanbag or hang upside down from the wall or whatever the kids do or on the mat. And we have blackboards. And whatever has happened throughout that morning will then become the focus of that lesson and numeracy mm. and literacy is my focus so that all of us I'm like we have a fireplace outside with 26 chairs around it each chair is painted of course according to the alphabets you know like letterland uh. 
so that the kids can play and hop and skip and their bodies are in the learning process so for example now we've played let's say we played ultimate frisbee today or they were on go-karts or they were on bicycles um as they waited for everybody to come in for example so they were on bicycles maybe that was the focus could be anything they were at the fish pond fishing or by the chickens holding you know that becomes the content they were focused in on it or anything a joke or somebody brings a book and now we zoom in okay let's make that our thing like for mm -hmm. example how many spokes in a bicycle wheel if you have two wheels you know multiplication everybody at their level and they all work together and it's amazing what you can do there's some heavy arithmetic potential in a bicycle and there's some very simple and of course as well writing so there's literacy in it as well and there's the visual aspect, there's the active aspect, the body is in it. You can go and test the bicycle again. In fact, you can go and count. It doesn't have to be abstract only. I like to also work with actual abakai. I've got a Japanese mm. abacus too. I've got the very simple 10, 10, 10 abakai, a big one so that we can play and use it. Mm. There's always a game factor. Any card game, a deck of cards can become any kind of arithmetic game. So there's always the gaming factor. Um, we do also have Wi-Fi. So even if we're in Africa, like you can see, we do have Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Banana Republic. That's the nicest thing about Africa is Banana Republic. So we, we have learned way back to become very resilient, you know. Mm. So when things fall apart, and they often do, we like, wow, cool, man. Let's just keep rolling. Um, any event. So, yeah, so it, it varies. So that kind of a lesson, there can also be a cooking thing going on. Like Mondays, we have a farmhouse kitchen. So we mm. forage and harvest and whatever we've cultivated or wild foods, whether it be wild uh, weeds that are edible and wild mushrooms, and we bring it into the pot and we have a cook up. And that then becomes the lesson and the content. You know, we yeah. have a menu and we count how much we've done. So that gives you an idea. And then after our sort of academics, we um, break off and then we either go on a hike or mm. we clean a chicken coop or we go fishing or whatever happens. Or we do art or signage or we do upkeep of our facility and adding on. We're constantly growing and, you know, like adding it on and making it like a... Um, and there's always a different amount of kids. Some come full time every day. So those phases mm. are regular. Then others come once a week or twice a week. And then they slot in with whatever is happening there. So it makes it interesting. Or we go on an outing, you know, out mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we are in a very beautiful area. And we've all got there. It's a mountain bike basically for everybody and their size or a go kart. So we must sometimes go and ride. Um, it really just depends and weather doesn't really matter you know we make our own sunshine so yeah nice. just keep... <laughs> so, so yeah if that's an idea yes so when you're as you're you know how many kids do you uh typically have on a day say about 10 yeah 10. on average okay. it's about 10 yeah so it's a yeah, pretty small a, group yeah it is a small group um and it is we have one facilitator per five kids so oh, make okay. sure somebody could be doing woodwork there others could be with a panga you know like a knife throwing a knife there we have parkour and bushcraft so we learn to in fact it's probably the only school where kids carry knives because mm -hmm. they know how to sharpen it they know how to throw it they know how to carve sticks with it we i use my knife for absolutely everything you know right right Actually, it's funny that when <laughs> when i so about 12 years ago I, or 10 years ago, I did some uh, studies of, uh, of, of the patterns of motivation in the, in the village free school and the village home education resource center. And uh, at the home, uh, home education resource center, I was asking, interviewing teachers as part of the study and asking them what was kind of different about uh, that environment versus a traditional environment. And I specifically asked for people who had taught in both. And one of the teachers at the Home Education Resource Center, so uh, uh, somewhat similar to your situation, but uh, she said, um, her answer to the question was, they treat us like a professional. And her example was that she, um, because she had come from, she had transitioned from a, a uh, she, she had taught in kind of traditional schools as a contractor, like coming in to do dramatic, drama type stuff. But then she transitioned to the homeschool resource center. And so she had some skills in, in uh, and so she actually said, I want to 
offer a knife making class. And she had prepared, she had come up, you know, all the safety plans and, and, and so she's prepared to get pushback, like, you know, what? <laughs> and, uh, and the executive director said, what do you need? And that blew her away because she was treated like the professional that she was and knew how to handle a class. And she, you know, yes, it's age mixed. So there's going to be kids with a variety of skills, but she was treated as a professional who knew that that was how this worked. You know, if she needed to set a boundary, she could set a boundary around age or whatever it was that needed to be set. So that was just the knife making is particularly like, right, and, or in your case, knife carrying, uh, you know, brought that like, yes, yeah, so that is a, a different way of understanding uh, what the capabilities of children are, um, but also kind of what it means to be in community uh, changes how you relate to the children and, and, and give them opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and so, so you're, you're, you know, talking about kind of, you know, like you said, you're probably the only school <laughs> uh, <coughs> in Africa <laughs> um, yeah. or maybe South Africa. I don't know. Uh, but, but it's rare for schools to, to really take out. In fact, there's, there's a, uh, there's a related program in uh, Oregon on the West coast of the U S and in Portland's the big city. That's where I uh, used to be. I'm in a little south of it now on a llama ranch. So I'm also in, you know, got animals and things. Uh, but, but there's a program, um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but, but they're, um, they, they taught, uh, bushcraft type stuff, uh, the Amer you know, uh, American version of that. And, and they, they, they have like the rules are don't die. <laughs> you know? And, and no, no injuries that won't heal and let in three, you know, injuries can only be healed in three days or less. You know, like, like they're setting some really clear boundaries, but, you know, it's like not the boundaries you expect, but they're also, um, th I think that's where that teacher had actually learned some of her uh, 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 skills on, for knife making, for instance, was that there's this other program that, that does the, you know, just has a vast variety of, of things. And, and they've actually scaled up quite a bit. Um, and, and so it's really interesting because they, they've been very successful in offering those kinds of skills to kids. Um, and, and have been operating for decades now. Um, so they've been doing it very successfully, which is important because, you know, sometimes there's a flash in the pan and the insurance company shut them down or the, or they just can't attract the people because no one trusts them. Well, these guys built up the trust and they really, you know, are, are successful at it. So it's really glad to see that there's now, now, um, one of the things I observed at the village free school was that when they had, uh, opportunities for the kids that were potentially dangerous or potentially controversial. Um, one of the ways that they handled that, because they were, they were a much bigger school than yours, they, they were uh, about 50 kids um, on a campus uh, in, in an urban area. Um, and so one of the things they did was they had what they called a certification process. We kind of, they would, de the kids would, when they wanted to take on that opportunity, they would demonstrate challenge. So do you have a, a systematic way or are you just having the conversation with the kids about what's appropriate and, and, and you know, reasonable to do. Okay, so basically everything is a try, has a try out the first session for whoever comes at whatever time. If mm -hmm. they are keen, if they show an interest, then mm -hmm. there's a free try out and they will try with the facilitator's knife, obviously. And then yeah. they can buy, if the parents then have to buy into it, literally put some skin in the game by actually buying them a starter knife. I mean, there is mm -hmm. a set. Everybody can have that one. And then the only rule, and that's the, the rule here, the only rule I set for the kids here, and then they make it up as they go, and I facilitate that mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, obviously, um, is what we do is I say everybody I, everybody must be their own boss. Mm -hmm. Okay, then they're like immediately like, wow, okay, so we can do what we want to say. So, yeah, that also means you have to be your own slave. You have to be your own master. <laughs> your own slave and they're like so that that's basically saying action and consequence okay mm. so whatever you can use whatever toy whatever you do uh, book doesn't matter but at the end of the day it goes back exactly where you found it that's what a master and a slave all in one does and mm. that's radical self-responsibility doesn't matter what you know from the toilet paper to the bush to making a fire and so, and the same thing with a knife, you know, mm -hmm. that's your knife and you are responsible for it. Nobody else to blame for yeah. there's no such thing as an accident either, mm -hmm. you know, 
And then obviously the parents are on board and they enjoy the fact that you know, this this in, it, eternal quest for safety, which means mm. that if you see a sign that says safety, you know it's going to be boring. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> boring. <laughs> and I mean, also, I had a lot of kids before the, the pandemic, pandemic, whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, things happened and petered out. But I was also more compromising before. Mm. And I had become much less so and knew after this, I actually have to be very uncompromising and stand my ground and saying, this is what this is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for creating something different and new and unique. And in South Africa, it is very different. Right. A lot of homeschooling going on, but they do replicate, copy, paste, content-wise what goes on in the school. Or it's lacquer. They go on outings and do more free-ranging stuff. But we are pretty much one of a kind. There are, there's two or three others in South Africa or four. Mm. There's also the Green School, you know, based on the Bali Green School um, system. Nice. We've got Riverstone, which is based on the Sudbury model. Oh, okay. And then we have one school not too far, like an hour from us, that's fairly farm schooly and a bit like us, but a bit more structured. Mm. But I, of course, now I've got very specific people and I'm very open about what I do. And I'm actually quite radical about it. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, natural law is natural law. And I work with this. And I tell people we are literally a flag ship for the new. We are not mm -hmm. going back to normal because, yeah, everybody was petering back to normal. I still think it's good. I'm not in it for the money. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in it to create everything new, even alternative economies, you name it. Mm -hmm. And I do have sessions where I speak to parents about how we do it, you know, and how we take responsibility and how we teach the kid or how, in fact, there isn't really teaching. It's about learning. Yeah. Um, I tell them, be your own boss. I don't like to be anybody's boss or teacher, but okay, I can. I'm very good at it. <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> I will do it, you know. So, and again, it's the same thing because they, they also taught by the, by the same tutor, um, Bushcraft, they taught Parker. So they know how to jump out of a tree and roll and fall without breaking their bones. Right. Mm -hmm. How to jump from rock to rock in the river. Boulders, in fact, without yeah. breaking them. And if they do get hurt and scratch, most of them are barefoot. They love it. It's just part of the game, you know. And it's part of this is what you do. And then you know where your own boundaries are physically because you get hurt. Exactly like you're saying. Right. So it is self-regulating in that sense. And that's beautiful that we do it. I mean, you fall off your bicycle, you get hurt. There's no like, oh, my God. No, it's like, okay, pick yourself up and let's go, you know. And right. if you need touching up, we've got herbs and, and all things <laughs> while going there. We can, you know, we administer that. And do you actually really need it, you know? And most of them don't. I mean, there's one game they play with go-karts going down a hill. Mm. And then they put obstacles in front of each other and they make that up the the level completely the extremity of it and i'm like at some point and i have to go, and then okay now i start going okay okay wow this is getting hectic you know so mm -hmm. i go and i check okay uh, have the objects got nails in them by any chance okay let's just check okay no all right okay guys this is like let's just discuss some sharp things in the way well what do you think like is it a good idea okay no then i said okay so so who wins in the game? Oh, no, the guy that gets hurt most. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. okay. So there's the parameters again, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Many of them are fun. Yeah, and it's so interesting. Um, the, the, the interactions, so you've got a very small group, and, and what I imagine is that when conflicts arise, um, that it's basically kind of calling a conversation. Is that fair to say? You know, like it, it's fair to say. Look, look, on a Thursday once a week, I do have up to twenty or thirty kids ah, because okay. that's where lots of them come, and they know that day, you know, they'll see all those buddies again. So right. the, it varies all the time, and that's what makes it interesting. There are conflicts, especially when tweens start getting into that age, tweens yep. and teens. Um, and what I like to do, I address the whole group, I don't call names when there's something that can't be resolved in the conversation. Yes, mm. that is very mm -hmm. fair to say because that it's, I always say ultimate frisbee guys, remember ultimate frisbee, 
first sort it out. I don't want to know about it. Sort it out between you two. So usually they do. Right. If I ever it starts to escalate, and I mean everybody's got social media, unfortunately, and and movies, and they see how it's being done, you know, in these teen movies. In other words, don't solve the problem. Go somewhere else in a half and create more of a problem. <laughs> right, right, right. You never understand it, but that's how drama works, I guess. Otherwise, right. there wouldn't be all these soapies and dramas, you know. People would just solve everything, communicate clearly, and be absolutely honest with each other and themselves. There would be no drama, so there would be no series. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. alas... Um, but when it does come up, I, I really like for, uh, I enjoy and I encourage those explosive situations. I always say to the kids, you know, this is not where we send people off to the principal's office and you have to get punishment or be expelled or sit in a bench as a display. This is a teaching moment where we can all learn from mm -hmm. the situation. So what do we do? So again, radically self-responsible for my own feelings, my own actions. So I can't blame another for them making me feel bad because these are my feelings. I'm not a victim. Right. So that's what I learn constantly, how to own my actions. Okay. And then also to put myself into other people's shoes. Um, so I do no harm, but I also take no shit, basically. That's <laughs> like a bottom line. Yeah. But at the same time, when, you know, they're hurting my feelings, they're bullying. Okay, cool. We'll look at them now. But how about you? Can you change other people? No. Can you change the way you respond? Yes. So you are a free person, right? You're not a victim. So it's constantly bringing them back to that. And that's kids, mm. kids respond to that much easier than adults. Yeah. Of course, yeah. The traumas and different experiences that do trip people up and reactive behaviors. And then, of course, parents who come with their stuff. So that's why I like to always have parents participate. A lot mm. of um, conventional and mainstream schools love to say we are a family we're a family it's so, so not a family if you have 30 people in your class and they're all sitting at a bench and half of them need to be medicated to just keep sitting and then of course they're not there either right that is not a family <laughs> right right yeah. yeah i like to include the parents in what i do so that what we do at school is replicated and more often than not also helping the, the parents should they right. drop the egos and they are know it all <laughs> because all of us adults think we know everything <laughs> but when they drop that we can all learn something about parenting you know and how mm -hmm. can it perhaps be done you know i always tell them i don't know everything either i can't i get out of bed in the day every day because i love to learn right. and that's why i have the school because i'm learning all the time that means question everything question myself drop old stuff you know the story so i, I model that behavior and I love learning and, and adapting and changing. And it's good for, so in other words, when these things come up, taking ownership and responsibility right. for my actions and the consequences thereof and not making it something or someone else's problem. Right. From right. recycling, cooking, you know, free ranging, free um, good food that is you know where it comes from etc etc so each right, and every right. oh. yeah. yeah and it really is, is is you know great to be living that context you know you know you're, you're on a farm you're in this place where where we're doing it and you're inviting them along and mm. then providing a rhythm to to enhance that to to not just say where well, you show up on a farm and, and random things happen. It's you, you develop the rhythm so that you're, and this is one of the things that, that, um, you know, a conversation that happens a lot in these kind of alternative spaces is there's this legacy of, of calling it an unstructured environment, um, mm. which is not true because you've structured a rhythm you've structured there. There's mm. things that have to happen as the fact that you're a farm. There's, mm. there's a ton of structure. Now, you may not be academically structuring or maybe minimally academic structuring because it sounds like you do have at least somewhat of an emphasis on the numeracy and literacy. Mm. Um, and then and then, of course, you know, like like what I like to point out is you're embedded in a society in which those literacy and numeracy types of structures are super useful. Like if you if you've got a passion to do something, man, it really helps if you can do that reading and that writing 
to to get better access to opportunities and to resources and to all those things and so that's one of those things where um like it just annoys me when people say lacking you know I, we don't structure anything it's like well yeah you do but <laughs> it's not an academic structure or it may not be an instructional structure like that emphasis on saying well we're not necessarily a teacher we're a facilitator um is to say we're not we're 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 we're, we're taking responsibility for an environment that's a facilitation as opposed mm -hmm. to we're going to fill this environment with stuff and we're going to make you do stuff <laughs> uh you know that's a different thing um now i, I did teach at the, the village free school for a year i taught psychology and and for even for me and that i mean i don't have formal instructional training so it was more about like okay you want to learn about psychology i have a degree in it and have been passionately studying it for a long time and then i came in with some ideas i did some things um, but it was also in that dialogue of how can we learn this and what could we, you know, let, let's tune into the things I try that are fun and I'll let go of the things that weren't so fun. And, <laughs> you know, really having that, that, that dialogue, uh, as, as, you know, and, and, and I was hired as a teacher an instructor <laughs> of that subject, but I, my attitude towards it was facilitation was what is this environment? How can we like, like what I did was I put up. Uh, three things that I think are important in psychology um, and, and just use that as kind of the reference It's like, oh, okay, how do we uh, uh, come back to those topics to that? Like, like situationism is, is something that is, is the situation is far more powerful than personality in terms mm -hmm. of what we found out. Now the assumption had been, and the kind of intuition most of us have is that our personality is this big thing and it determines how we're going to behave. And it's really important. And what mm. psychology has consistently found is, no, not really. I mean, it's not irrelevant, but it's not what the in, your intuitions are completely wrong, and mine are too, <laughs> about the role that it plays. Um, and so that's one of those things where it's like, okay, let's keep coming back to that. And so when you know, having them bring in, you know, their own experience or or somebody they're reading about, and then say, oh, interesting. Were they this like uh, one of the one of the people that someone brought up was Nelson Mandela? And so one of the conversations was, was he a big personality or was it his situation? <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's like you, you, inescapably you have to say it is both because it's it's not irrelevant. It's something, but you have to also say, okay, there's a whole lot going on. And then what you're creating as an educator, even if you don't call yourself a teacher, is an environment in which those dialogues can happen. You have yourself to offer and a and a and a farm that you're operating at and then you have a conversation about okay how do you show up here and how do you change mm -hmm. what we do every day like you said it, w would it be fair to say you you, you would uh, uh we, if you use the term curriculum would you say it's an emergent curriculum yeah you could say that look it's a, it's a, yeah it's an organic curriculum i suppose because mm -hmm. it emerges as a good evolving organic yes emergent is beautiful yeah, yeah. it is constantly growing and and I, I have a lot of fun in it. I mean, there was nothing mm -hmm. worse for me in you know, mainstream school getting a textbook and instructions to the teacher that are so long. At this second and that minute, you have to teach this thing from that textbook to these children. And you like look at them, and you look at this, and you're like, are they are they sure are they really referring to organic humans, or is right. this like are we programming a robot? Yeah, like. What you know, and actually, that's obviously the latter, which is a a pity because that instructionist, very pedantic, specific, controlling, was so boring and so frustrating, and all encompassing and administratively so overloading that yeah. you know, a, 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 any even the best teachers would lose the plot, you know, in that, right. and how can you be inspired? with that also the inspector breathing over your shoulder right. and in this case it's completely almost the other way around it becomes an enjoyment and the participation in each second is a channeling and it just grows and happens with again situational i love that too. Right. right you know it's a bit like nature versus nurture you know and right you know, anyways yeah it is the the environment i mean einstein also said he doesn't Teach, he just creates an environment for learning in many ways, and then you facilitate it, like you said. And with within the the rhythm, it's it's like jazz, you know. There is yeah. a beat, 
but you can improvise and you play and there's there's different instruments and different things happening but it's still all together music right know? right and um, and and what it means to make music is to to play in within a structure it yes. is there is it is still music it is even if you even if you think you're eliminating structure like uh john coltrane's i forget the famous one uh 223 is that or is it three anyway the one that's just is is a sustained silence <laughs> um yes. but even that only works within the structure of an audience and a playbill that's that presents this performance and so there's and then the musician shows up and holds that space for that time and and that is it is avant-garde but it is still working with a structure that is given by the society by the by the idea of music itself and playing with that um, and so so it's really interesting to e even even the least structured piece of music has a structure within which it it can only work in within that structure uh, it's just done the most extreme job you can do with it which is brilliant which is brilliant for it for what it you know what it is uh, yeah yeah um, yeah, I mean, same when God art way back, you know, you're you, uh, urinal suddenly in an art gallery. So mm, now right. it becomes, you know, so you shifting. And again, uh, I, you know, I'm an artist also, and I realized at some point in my life that to create art on a canvas within a frame, okay, that's the structure. Right. But what happens outside the frame? Mm -hmm. so I realized my whole life is an artwork, so I can actually create and paint my whole life out forget the frame and right. it's the same unschooling de-schooling in the way we all operate that i always remind people everything 24 7 is learning it is mm -hmm. not confined to what we do here what we do in a box or in a classroom it is always learning and then everybody like oh yeah right in fact we <laughs> only really start learning when we leave school <laughs> when, you know, so when you're out the box that's when you learn otherwise you're just told what you think and do and you don't learn like that you just like rote learning and okay i'll just feed it back to you <laughs> that is isn't the, yeah you know. yeah it is it, it's interesting it's because it's, in, in everyday life exactly we do breakfast we do lunch we do supper you know there's family time there's sleep time so exactly yeah yeah yeah, and that's the, one of the things that um, the other one of the other pieces from the psychology is that uh, creating the good requires more than eliminating the bad. Hmm. And this is this was the advent what you know really became clear when when it, the reason that a, a a subfield in psychology is called positive psychology was this realization. Um, and it got formalized because the president of the American Psychological Association said, this should be a thing <laughs> and and voila you know it has a longer history than that it was like the late 90s um it, when he did that but it's it has a deeper history because there were people who had these insights along the way and then you realize like oh and and this is where i see in education is is that that people like yourself have have realized that there's there's more to education than merely those academics, and so so that's that's part of the emphasis of this of the of the title of the show is the agentic uh, uh, schools, is that is that what I see, and I don't know that practitioners like yourself see it this way, um, but what I see is that that you generated something, you created a structure for agency, you created a way to support children's agency. In my world, as a psychologist, uh, as someone who's studies psychology is really about it to me in my way of thinking about it agency is an educative process is you have to they have to have agency that's how they educate mm. the the old idea that you know you take something out of your head put it over there into their head and then you measure it and you're good um mm. is not even plausible if from mm. from just from how brains work like okay. that doesn't even make sense um, and so when you when you eliminate that idea, you have to say, okay, well, what what is it? And this is where I think the that you know coming forward as these type of schools 
we need to have to say what is the positive thing we're putting in there and i think that should be a conversation about agency um mm. and so when you like like when you create the rhythm part of what you're doing is saying there's a punctuated beat there's a beat in there you know the morning starts and we start with something and and you you you've created a little like Warm up. Well, that's a good a good example. Is just sort of okay. Well, let's adjust to this environment that we've put ourselves in, and then things happen, you know, as you describe. And so that's saying you've exercised agency to a minimal degree, but what you've done is exercise your agency in a way that enables and encourages theirs. It mm-hmm. says now it's your turn. And just in the same way, in jazz, you set up someone to solo. You yes. set up someone. It's not like they just decide it's a collective and you know collective property of how that system works it's okay now solo you know but that happened within a structure (laughs) um and so so that's where to me it's like it's really interesting to say okay you know seeing yourself as a conductor of agency in a sense um you know and 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 in order to do that you as someone who's taught I have to say, okay, here are the places, here's the, here's the elements where I'm going to step back from that idea of teaching. Does that, does that sound like a, a fair way to <laughs> talk about what you're doing? Yes, and, and to illustrate more, and that's what I also wanted to say earlier on about the, the rhythm, is that within, let's say, even the start of the day, the warm-up, it, it, there is a question, we know it's warm-up, but what would you like to do for warm-up? Uh, yeah. And then who would like to facilitate the warm-up? Mm. You know, and it could be any of the kids, or if they don't, they no, I'll carry on. We do a Simon Says version, mm. so everybody gets a turn to say, Simon Says, do this, and they do a warm-up, uh, one of the act- uh, things. Or And which activity after the warm-up? It doesn't have to be Frisbee. Mm. And even sometimes in terms of content, in fact, more often than not, they are the agents of the content that they're learning, you know. Nice. So, yeah, ab- absolutely. And I like to stand back and I always tell them, I really don't want to be the teacher or the boss here. So the idea is that all of you will be that. But again, I come back to you. You can fall. They do. Ultimately, of course, everything does fall back on the guy that is that guy. But I would like to. And it does happen. And people take turns organically. And when there's a birthday person also I always say it's your day. You know, you can arrange mm. if you want everybody to dress up. Go wild, you know. I always tell everybody every day is my birthday. So (laughs) (laughs) choose the same, to be honest. You know, so turn taking um, in terms of leading certain activities, also obviously in terms of who's more keen on certain things. I mean, there's a hype. They always have people. I don't even have to always go with, you know. So Mm -hmm. that is beautiful to be able to stand back. But it's a frightening concept for a conventional teacher right. because you have to go into trust mode. And it's actually a Buddhist exercise of choosing the middle path because you are mm. in control and you're also into let go. Mm. And then you have to do that. Because also when I'm managing and facilitating here, knowing what goes on, people look at me and, and I'm actually completely conscious of what goes on everywhere. There's one guy up a tree and there's one guy behind by the chicken coop. Because it is just to be aware and conscious. It's not a passive go to sleep exercise whatsoever. Right. So that is also important to to create agency for everybody. Is still to be responsible for what I've allowed, what I'm allowing to happen. That's right. Know? That's right. And and so, one, so I'm not familiar with um, the South African context for education, uh, or I'm I'm trivially. I've read some books about the transition after after uh, uh, apartheid ended, uh, which has been difficult. I understand, um, but but as the kind of operation that you're running there, um, are there government inspectors or or oversight or any like what's the context for you operating that that kind of facility? Okay, it's a good question. So all schools, all homeschoolers, every single child in this country is supposed to be registered with the government hmm. and their version of education, which is the education department, the South African education department. You're supposed to register your child and then you're supposed to send them to school. That's it. Hmm. So there's been a constant battle 
that parents are saying, but I, my child is my responsibility, not the government's. Mm -hmm. But so you have these people who stand up and say, no, you can't tell me what to do with my kid, but they still, you're still on the radar in that sense. And right. so people are joining with um, a certain body which will represent them in court if ever there's a repercussion for not yeah. sending to a conventional school. So the government tries to control, as all governments do, yeah. And then it's like there's a period where okay, homeschooling school, and then again they try and outlaw it, and ah, and so it goes on. But they always want to know and control everything. Doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you do with your kid. Um, there's also groups that are called like a group called Leave Our Kids Alone. There's mm -hmm. unfortunately a lot of what they the department is bringing in, which is from the United Nations and all this. I mean, we don't have to go into that now. But in terms of teaching very young children, you know, certain sexuality things and that, and mm. it's just not appropriate and we all, but most people still would just drop and go their kids and they're outsourcing parenting to an institution. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it a school. So we are, <laughs> what I've realized, and that's in the last three years in particular, is that these things are once again, just scared, airy tactics, because who is going to follow up? And how they're going to enforce it, especially in the Banana Republic. Mm -hmm. And we are notoriously bad at doing admin, our, our, our government and any of the other things. So basically, I laugh at it and I go back to we are our own government. And mm -hmm. we shall, the parents and I, because I'm a sovereign human being, it is my natural law, my God-given right to choose how I want to learn and how my child learns. Mm -hmm. and the same, I give the same right to other people and they must choose. Do they want to register? For me, as so, if, if you're scared of a dog, it's going to bite you. <laughs> but if you're not, he's going to be your friend. Yeah. Or, or you just ignore him. You know, and I, I ignore things that are irrelevant. And for me, all authority, there's no, there's no, there's no authority. There's only one authority, but no man is it. Mm. And I will, everybody is equal. So I will not let any other man or woman or authority or man-made authority whatever tell me what i must do in my daily life and that mm -hmm. absolutely no so and it works perfectly well you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some parents will maybe but they also they get onto it and they we just get on with our lives yeah and we just yeah. do our own thing independently without making a big thing about it you know right right if it ever comes our way we will but there is it's it's not going to happen energetically yeah. we know we're doing the right thing and um, this is what needs doing so we're on the mm -hmm. good side and good to you know right, so, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, in the united states it's quite variable from state to state and oregon in particular is you know they have some minimal requirements um but i know from dealing with a variety of homeschool organizations that most of them are sort of you know the parents get to make the choice about how they handle it similar to what you're doing um, and, and Oregon, you know, uh, is just doesn't have any real, uh, resources to pursue people who are not complying. Um, and so from a practical standpoint, it's not really relevant. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's all of, all up to the, most of the organizations allow parents to just decide however they're going to handle it. Uh, and then they, they accommodate accordingly. Um, so, so very similar in some ways. <clears throat> very cool. Well, I think um, we, we've had a good, good conversation here. I really appreciate um, what you're doing. Um, it sounds like it's really, I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so I want to really thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing that with us. Um, yeah, hopefully someday I, I uh, We'll we'll get to Africa and we can we can uh, I can see how you play together with the kids. Um, I hope. <laughs> um, so so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and and I um, yeah I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Now